Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, David Colburn, director of the Bob Graham Center. Thanks for being with us this evening. Uh, one would hope with the talent we've got on this stage, we'd have a bigger audience because these are two extraordinary folks. And we at the Bob Graham Center are just fortunate to, to work with Mike Foley on a reasonably regular basis. Uh, as far as we're concerned, you can't work enough with Mike to uh, bring programs to the students and the faculty and the community here at the Bob Graham Center. And once again, he's uh, delivered one of the really extraordinary figures in American journalism in Lucy Morgan. The way we'll do it tonight is the way we've been doing it of late. We have an open mic, so after uh, Mike and Lucy finish their conversation, We'll ask you to come to the mic, and uh, we'll also ask you not to make a speech, um, but to ask a question, and to ask a succinct question, which is not always the forte of any of us, but we would hope you'd do that, because we want to hear more of what Lucy has to say about her observations on the American political scene, and particularly the Florida political scene. So with that, I'll have Mike Foley introduce Lucy Morgan. Good evening. I am Mike Foley. I am, a, believe it or not, appearances will deceive you. Uh, I am a professor at the College of Journalism and Communications, uh, and it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Lucy Morgan. Uh, Lucy and I have been colleagues uh, for ooh, a long, long time, <laughs> and uh, and I, I, it is my estimation that Lucy Morgan is the best reporter I have ever known. Just the oldest. <laughs> So it's going to be like that, huh? It is. Uh, but in any event, uh, Lucy, uh, of course, was just inducted into the uh, Newspaper Hall of Fame, the Florida Newspaper Hall of Fame, up, 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 an incredible honor. And she also was the re uh, honored uh, one through a dint of incredibly hard and, and somewhat risky work, won the 1995 uh, Pulitzer Prize for Investigative Journalism, which was a real uh, crowning achievement, and we'll talk about that for certain. Uh, she is uh, tenacious. She is connected. She has the best sources of any reporter I have ever known. And she was truly feared in Tallahassee. Probably still is, even though you retired for the second time. Uh, so we'll start. Let's start at the beginning, okay? It's an interesting story how you got into journalism. It was a total accident. <laughs> I was living in Crystal River and had the mother of three small children when a woman knocked on my door and said she was the area editor for the Ocala Star Banner. Her name was Frances DeVore. She lived between here in Ocala, I think. And uh, she asked me if I would uh, work as a reporter for them. Uh, they had just lost their local correspondent in a traffic accident. And I said, well, why would you come to my door? I've never written anything. And she said, well, the local librarian tells me that you read more books than anybody in town. And I figured that if you read, you could probably write. So would you try it? Well, I, we, I needed money, so I thought, why not? <laughs> and tried it and liked it. <laughs> uh, started off at, tw they paid me 20 cents an inch for everything I would write. Five bucks for any picture I would take. Uh, I have never in the 40-something years since then uh, been able to write anything short to save my life. <laughs> that I can attest to. <laughs> no question about it. But I, I love that story because it is so alien to the landscape of journalism today. That I never had a journalism class. I never had to put up with a Mike Foley <laughs> in a class. <laughs> I see several of my students out there and they're sympathizing here. Um, in 1985, as we, we talked about before, you, you did win the Pulitzer Prize for Investigative Journalism. Tell me a little bit about that. The Pulitzer? Mm-hmm. Or what got there? What got there? Oh. Well, I had been writing about a couple of bad sheriffs over in Dixie and Taylor County that were involved with some drug smugglers. And uh, I kept hearing from people in Pasco where I happened to live. My husband also worked for the Times down there. And uh, that I should actually be looking at the Pasco sheriff. Well, things happened that uh, a source or two came my way and wanted me to do something on him, and I, so I started looking at him. And one of the issues uh, involved the quality of deputies he had. Um, so I decided to do a background on him. He didn't do a very good background on his men, so I thought I'd do it for him. And I found that uh, one in every eight deputies had a criminal arrest record for something other than DUI or traffic. 
uh, more than half of them had lied about that record when they got certified by the state uh, bureau of standards for police officers and uh, the, and some of them had their driver's licenses suspended, one in the neighboring county, uh, but he was given a green and white cruiser and a gun and a badge and allowed to run amok there. Um, perhaps, perhaps my favorite was a guy who had driven the car in an armed robbery in Tampa, uh, had been granted immunity in return for his testimony against two other people, so he didn't have the conviction for the bank robbery. Uh, but upon his arrest for it, he went home and tried to kill himself, and he took a shotgun and blew out the wall behind him, uh, missing himself. Uh, so thereupon, we have a bad shot, an armed robber who rats out his friends, and they give him a badge and a gun and say, drive a cruiser around our county and see what you can do. And there were a number of equally offensive deputies. Uh, one, there was an outstanding warrant for one. He had stolen the canine that had been assigned to him in Monroe County in Key West uh, when he left the department. And so there was an outstanding grand theft for him, warrant for him at the time they hired him. But it was just a, a series of things like that. Uh, he was doing a lot of business with his, the sheriff there was doing a lot of, of commercial business with some of his deputies who got favored treatment in return. Uh, and um, he was using 16-year-old informants who were trading sex for drugs, and then they would arrest the guys that traded sex. That part of the story came after I started some of the other stories on him uh, from an inmate in the jail. And if you know, if you've ever been a reporter in Florida, you get tons of letters from inmates who are innocent. They're all innocent, and uh, some of them actually are. And this one was telling me about how he got arrested from this teenage girl who traded sex for drugs. I didn't believe the letter at first. And then I went over and at some point and pulled the court files and found that's exactly what had happened. Uh, but the sheriff was just letting these girls run loose without any supervision. Uh, they were, when I found them finally, they were working as hookers, one in Tampa and one in Atlanta. I spent a whole day in a stripping stripper bar in Atlanta convincing them that I was A, not a cop, and B, not somebody's mother to get them to talk to me. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, it was a whole series of stories that ran, and uh, I suppose uh, one of the, the sheriff got real unhappy about it. One of the things they did was, somebody did, we never knew who, slit the screen around my pool enclosure and put in a lid of something with meat in it that was poison so that my cat, Trouble, I ate it and was violently ill. Fortunately, somebody got home early that day and called and we got him to a vet who was a friend and knew how much we cared about the cat. Um, sometimes it's, I have been accused of caring too much about the cats, uh, but, and it's true, but uh, we saved Trouble. He lived to be 19 years old and uh, uh, but that was one of many threats I got. Are you into the bumper sticker here? We could do the, we could do the bumper sticker okay. here, yes. Uh, <laughs> I had an, an elderly woman call me one morning in the midst of all these stories where we're practically under siege. I had the best patrolled house in town. And um, this woman says, Lucy, the sheriff is handing out a bumper sticker with your name on it. And I said, what else does the bumper sticker say? Well, nothing else, just Lucy Morgan. Uh, it's blue with white letters. I said, there's nothing else on the bumper sticker? She said, well, there's a nail off to the left of Lucy Morgan. I said, could that be a screw? I said, screw Lucy Morgan? Yes, that's what it is. Well, he was handing them out with his campaign literature. Uh, but uh, I understand the Pulitzer Committee was really offended by that. But so I can thank him for helping me get a Pulitzer, I guess. It's pretty good. Um, uh, recently, you called Florida elected officials stupid and arrogant in the same sentence. Yes. Can you can you explain? <laughs> well, I think that sentence was referring to the Speaker of the House. The, the, what was then the Speaker of the House, Will Weatherford, and the Governor and a few others who took uh, the trips offered by U.S. Sugar to a ranch in Texas where they went hunting at U.S. Sugar's expense uh, while allowing U.S. Sugar to continue polluting the Everglade and do worse things. Uh, yes, I, I do, did call them stupid and arrogant, and uh, they are. 
if you had, if you would come up and get a little closer to him in Tallahassee, you could see it for yourself. <laughs> Never back down, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, you talk a lot about how you, you get your, your your sources. You you have sources virtually everywhere, and people trust you, and that's where you get your information. How does that work? Well, sometimes I'm never sure, except that I like people, and I have a, I you know I tend to I was grew up in the South. We 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 hug and call each other honey, and uh, you know smile and speak to people we don't know. I mean, all these things that, that happen in the South, I guess. Uh, but uh, I guess I could explain it best with, this, with telling you about George. Uh, George was an inmate in the Pasco County Jail from his mid-teens forward most of his life. And um, he, um, when he, he, was, he had a tendency to drink and use any drug that he happened to pass by. So he was frequently in jail, but when he was in jail, he was always a good trustee. So they would appoint him to sweep the floors and wash the cruisers and things. And I went through the office every day on my, making my rounds in the sheriff's department, and George read the paper every day, so he would always want to talk about a story that was in the paper, and I'd stop and talk to him. or He was reading a book and wanted to ask me about it or something, and so we became sort of friends. Well, it, after a while, George would slip over to a phone when something bad was happening and the sheriff didn't want anybody to know about it and call me and say, y'all might want to get a photographer or a reporter out to such and such a location that has been a murder or whatever, and we'd get somebody there. On one occasion, the sheriff got so angry about a Times reporter showing up that he polygraphed everybody in, in the department except George. He did not consider George a human being. Uh, and George, uh, so George became just sort of a routine tipster on stuff that happened over a long period of years. He later went to work for the DEA and did drug cases all over the state. So I developed these great drug sources all over the state through George. But um, he, um, uh, he was scary looking. He was about 6'4" hair down to his shoulders with a must, Fu Manchu mustache and beard and he never wore shoes, only flip flops. Uh, usually he wore a shirt that the sleeves had been ripped out of and cut offs um, and he was huge. He knocked on my door one time on Christmas Eve and one of our daughters who was home um, answered the door and frightened her to death. She comes running back in the house, there's this man out there on the doorstep and I looked, it was George bringing me a jar of his grandmother's jelly. Uh, and, but he looked so bad that any time he would visit me in the office, the editors would keep coming to look to see if there was something wrong or something that had happened. But um, George, after I went to Tallahassee and quit doing all the, as many drug stories, uh, George called me from Shands here. Uh, his liver had blown up on him and he was dying. And he wanted to know if I would come down and visit him that he thought he had a few days. So I came down to see him and he, he told me, I know you never used my name and you never let anybody know that you were getting information from me, but I want you to use it now and tell people that I always thought that there would be a tomorrow that I could clean up and, and that everything would be all right. But I want all these people out there to know that there is no tomorrow when you've done what I do. Uh, so in the end, I wrote a column about George and, uh, and identified him. I'm sure it made the sheriff happy. Switching gears just a little bit, we talked about this earlier today, uh, Florida has some of the best open records laws in the United States. It's really a, a, a privilege to be here and, and to work in the journalism business here. Uh, but we see that as, as dangerous, uh, that is, there's a danger of that being changed. Well, unfortunately we don't have public officials that match the good laws. Uh, so I think we are in a lot of danger. We have a governor who absolutely hates the public records law. I'm not sure he knew it existed when he ran for the job the first time. Uh, I understand from someone who was asked to brief him the day after the election that he was stunned to discover that a lot of what he wrote and did would be public record. And that he and the people who surrounded him just couldn't believe that anybody would have a right to get uh, his email or other records. Uh, he's done a lot to sort of try to pretend to like to, to comply with the law. He puts his email up online. 
However, when something bad happens, they take down whole segments of the email, or it never gets up there, I should say. And so that it's, it's, you'll, when I wrote this, he gave away his dog, he got a dog, <laughs> and had a contest on Facebook during his first campaign to um, name the dog. Na the name that won that he chose was Reagan, of course. Uh, and uh, then a day or two after he took office, he got rid of the dog. And I was trying to find out what happened to the dog. No one would answer the question. Uh, then they really got mad at me when I asked his communications guy if he had killed the dog. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the dog, nobody knows exactly where the dog wound up, but Reagan is gone. But the governor has told us that Reagan had scared his photographer and he thought he had to get send him back to where he had gotten him. Uh, he called it a rescue dog, but all of the ye le yellow lab rescue societies in Florida say they never gave him a rescue dog. They don't know where he got it. Um, but he sent it back somewhere, he said, because it frightened E.T., the photographer that has worked for a whole bunch of governors. Um, E.T. fixed up the phone and calls me and he says, Lucy, I raise pit bulls. Do you think I would be afraid of a yellow lab puppy? <laughs> so we wrote several stories about Reagan, the missing dog, uh, and uh, it, it just happens. I'm sure it was an accident, a total coincidence, but we heard the governor was getting a lot of hate mail from dog owners all over the state, and when I tried to pull his email for the two weeks after the dog story ran, it was not there, and it never has gotten there. So things like that happen. Uh, he also flies his own plane, which you might think is a really nice thing. I mean, here he is, he's using his own plane and he's paying for it. But he has declared it secret so it doesn't appear on the websites that trace where planes fly. There is a website that you can put it on your iPad and you can touch the little plane flying over and it will tell you the end number of the plane. If it's an airline, it'll tell you where it started and where it's going. And it'll neat little app that you can put on there, but you can't find the governor's plane on it because he's opted out of it. He will not issue any information on where he's going, who's going with him, uh, or what he's doing. After years of having governors, uh, including Bob Graham, who routinely released their flight schedule, who was on the plane, and essentially what, what they were doing at various stops. So we have sort of a secret governor running around the state, and none of us can tell you where he is. He would not let reporters travel with him during the campaigns, uh, as most governors have, uh, or most candidates for governor have. So that he, he's gotten there, paying his, buying the, the office essentially. He spent 75 million of his own money to win the first time. We don't know how much money he spent the second time, and we may never know it all because of all of the campaign finance uh, regulations that have just gone to hell in the last few years. Uh, so much secret money can get into him. We know he's claiming that he put in like 12 or 13 million. We think it's more than that. Uh, and we may be no better when we get to the next campaign finance reporting period, uh, but we don't really know now. So there's just a lot of things. Uh, there are lots of s suggestions that he has dramatically understated his net worth by like $320 million or something like that. Uh, some of the financial reporters who are better than I at looking at financial re records uh, have written uh, a whole lot about this, and I'm... I, they, and I, so we have an atmosphere, a governor who, who doesn't like our, the records law, a legislature who frequently gets mad at the records law, and I think the potential for serious change is great. Now, by comparison, let me tell you a Charlie Chris story. A few years ago, I discovered a judge had secretly retired and come back, gotten reelected, come back on the 1st of January and was drawing a salary, a state pension, and about 700000 in deferred comp money, a judge from Collier County. And it, I was about to write about him, and it dawned on me there might be more than one. So I called the Supreme Court Administrator's Office and asked if they knew. And, oh, there are no more, just this one judge. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't take their word for it. So I called the Division of Retirement and asked for a list of all retired, of all state employees who also were drawing pensions and they refused to give it to me. I spent a week waltzing around with them trying to get it. Pat Gleason in the governor's office was trying to help. Um, she couldn't get it. About four o'clock on a Friday, she called me and she said, Lucy, I don't know what to do next, but they just won't give it to me either. 
And uh, so I said, well, uh, did you tell the governor? And she said, no, I haven't. I said, I'm going to call him. I just wanted to warn you. So I called Charlie Crist, who always gave reporters his cell phone number, and returned calls, at least returned them to me. I don't know, but I think he returned them to most people. Uh, but so I called him. I said, Governor, I have this situation where people are, some people are retiring, taking both a salary and a pension, getting a lot of, of deferred comp money. And I believe there are a lot of them. I had by then heard that there were several thousand. And I want to get the list. And your division of retirement won't give me the list. It was 4 o'clock on 4.15 on Friday. He said, you'll have that list by 6 o'clock. I did. He sent. He ordered the Division of Retirement to release it to Pat Gleason and her to release it to me. They were still refusing to give it out. Uh, so I had the list by then. There were 8,000 state employees in that position, including oh, somewhere about 50 judges. Uh, so I, at, at every point along the way, somebody had lied about it uh, until we got the list. Uh, so that, that's the contrast in the two governors that we are facing. And the current governor just about won't ever answer anybody's question with actually something that's responsive to the question. Now, you could say that about Bob Graham, too, but he was funnier. <laughs> so why is uh, Rick Scott governor? He bought it. The negative ads? Ne I think the negative ads uh, on both sides uh, tended to make people think neither one of these guys should be governor. And, uh, and I've actually heard otherwise intelligent people telling me that they voted for Mickey Mouse or... or, uh, or just failed to check any candidate on that race. Uh, Gwen Graham in all of the North Florida counties got more votes than Chris did, and that's really unusual. Usually the, the person running for governor would get more votes than somebody running for Congress or legislature. You once wrote a, a story that sparked enormous outrage about a, uh, was it a judicial complex? The Taj Mahal. That you dubbed the Taj Mahal. Tell us about that. Well, I, I got a call from a lawyer saying, have you seen the new courthouse that the first district court is building? I said, no. They said, you need to go look at it. And so I rode out and looked at it. And it was, I mean, I mean it, was huge. it was bigger than the Supreme Court, uh, much more posh. Um, and so then I heard that there were records that I might be interested in at the Division of Management Services, which supervises construction of state buildings. And somebody told me the email between the judges and the agency would be interesting, so I asked for them and got them. I then asked for records from the court, and let me tell you how good judges are at supplying you the records. They had about four meetings of the, all the 15 judges to discuss my request for a public record. I could have thrown a hand grenade in their door and had less impact uh, than I did by giving them a public records request. Uh, but um, I, um, uh, I, so I, had, I already had the emails. I knew that the judges had been really nasty to the state employees who were trying to hold back what they were about to build and make it a, a little more economical. Uh, so I knew there must be more in the court. They took the records they gave me and gave them to me in two big legal size boxes. They had taken the staples out of every document and shuffled them all so that I had two huge boxes of paper uh, that I had, it took me about a month to reconstruct all of the memos and stuff that was in it. Uh, but uh, then I started writing stories about it. And alas, the, they charged the chief judge with being an arrogant jackass, basically. And he's no longer a judge. He's a lobbyist now. <laughs> Perfect. So you're, you're a real pain in the ass then, right? I am. Yes. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry at all. <laughs> no, she's not. All right. Uh, you were once sentenced to several months in jail. Oh, you want to talk about my record, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I want to expose it to everybody. Yeah, tell us about that. Well, I'd written a story speculating on what a grand jury was doing in Dade City, and the state attorney didn't like that at all. The judge liked it even less. So uh, they summoned me in to ask where I had gotten my information, and I initially refused to tell them. And they, I got, for that, I got five months. The judge was waiting in the next room. And uh, the day of publication of the story, by the way, by 10 o'clock I had a subpoena to appear later the same day. And um, I, uh, so I was sentenced to five months. 
but I, we had raised the question of whether they could do it without taking the issue to the grand jury. And um, so they, the state attorney went back and reconsidered and said, well, I'll subpoena you back to, to the grand jury and ask you again. So they brought me in and asked me all the same questions. And I didn't quite give them the same answers. I refused to tell them anything about sources, but I did give them a copy of the story. I had, I had sat outside the, the grand jury room watching everybody coming and going so I knew who was testifying and what they were taking in and out of the room and stuff. Uh, and they, the investigation was as a result of some of our stories, so I knew a lot about what they must be doing. And uh, I, so I colored in blue the stuff that I had observed going on in the, or I guess it was green, I'm sorry, the stuff I had observed in the hallways. And then I covered in bright purple the stuff the state attorney himself, the guy who was subpoenaing me, had told me. And then two little paragraphs in blue uh, that had come from sources I would not name. Of course, you know, those are the only two things they wanted to know where it came from. Uh, and uh, it, the state attorney was not happy with me about that. I have a problem with uh, authority, I guess. Uh, but um, uh, so they sentenced me to another three months. Uh, we appealed. Uh, for took us about three years and a lot of money. Uh, but we won uh, a right to withhold sources uh, from prosecutors and others that might want them under most circumstances. The, there are exceptions uh, that are exceptions nationwide because the U.S. Supreme Court hasn't been all that friendly either to reporters who want to keep sources. But uh, it has the the statute has, the uh, court ruling has been used for years to keep a lot of reporters from being subpoenaed. You mentioned money. Uh, you and I were reminiscing today about when I was at the paper, uh, and those in those days, uh, there was plenty of money. We we're making lots of money. Yes, I, I was working on a Scientology story. Uh, Scientology, Scientology people who sign up with Scientology frequently wind up dead, and I had found about two hundred of those people uh, around the world that were dead as a result of the Scientology regimes and uh, sometimes just being held by Scientology when they got and when they were trying to leave and uh, like we'd had a rather not notable death in Clearwater and uh, so one of the deaths I found was a guy that jumped out of a 12-story building uh, after he was being pressured by Scientology to uh, pay them a whole bunch more money and the French government had charged him with manslaughter uh, and so when I Told when I was talking about the deaths I had with Mike, he said, oh, that death in Leon, that would be a much better story if you went to Leon and found the widow. And I, so if you insist, I'll go to Leon and find the widow. So I did and found her. Uh, but uh, I, I also said, well, you know, the Scientology Worldwide Headquarters in, is out just outside of London. Maybe I should check there too. So I, I wound up going to London and Paris and Leon. Uh, I don't think if I walked in his office today, he would say that again. Uh, <laughs> Those were the glory days. Things have changed drastically. So what do you think today, Lucy, at the state of journalism in Florida is now and, and maybe nationally? I have to clean up my language here. I, it's pitiful. Um, I think that some of the papers in the state have just gone way down. Um, the Gannett papers in particular Tallahassee Democrat is, is to be specific. It's just pitiful. They had no reporter in the Capitol this week to cover the uh, opening of the new legislature. None. Uh, they happened to have a, a Bill Cotterell, who's a retired Democrat reporter, happened to go over there for Reuters, who's doing some freelancing for, and shot a few pictures. And they, when they heard that he had been there and shot pictures, they started bargaining with him on how much can we buy them for and he wound up making a few bucks off of them but um, and so they did use a couple of pictures but they thought, forgot to send a reporter uh, and um, uh, there's just a whole lot that goes uncovered by them um, I, um, I do today it, the we saw an announcement just as we were about to come over here that uh, Gate, Gatewood Media has bought the uh, all of the Halifax papers, which include the Gainesville Sun. Uh, that can't be good news. Uh, I was I noticed from reading the Gainesville Sun this morning that the paper looks a whole lot better than the Tallahassee Democrat, uh, and I mean it's got a lot more news in it. The Democrat has erased all their photographers; they have none anymore. Uh, they're using citizen-submitted pictures for most of what they're printing. Um, 
and sometimes they're identified and sometimes they're not. Uh, it's just, it really is pathetic. Now, everybody is in this stage. I don't know that any of us know exactly where this is going to wind up. There are a whole host of things, I think, that have brought us to this point in journalism. Uh, the Internet's part of it. The 24-7 news channels are part of it. Um, but nobody's come up with a really clear way to distribute news. We're, we're very fragmented right now, and I think that's bad for, for the state and the country because it means that there's so many different places you can look for news, not everybody, A, knows where those are. There's not a single newspaper that, that, that many people can pick up that's doing a good job. Uh, and uh, you're, it means that a lot of people can look at only that which they agree with, so that they're not getting a broad look at what's going on in the world. And, um, and, then, but, and nobody's really figured out how to make a lot of money out of the digital distribution. Maybe you and I could invent something that hey, would Greg, do this. I could use the, use the money. <laughs> uh, so then, in light of all that, what advice? These people are obviously interested in, in the world. They're a, a, a sophisticated bunch, for the most part, uh, with few exceptions. <laughs> How do you know that? <laughs> I'm assuming. I, I know I shouldn't. What advice would you give these people? To find information, what would you? To, to I would say buy the best daily newspaper you can find every day. In some communities, that may be the New York Times or the Tampa Bay Times, uh, and and then uh, branch out from there. Uh, there are a lot of news aggregator sites that will deliver to your e email in the morning uh, a summary of Florida news, um, and. Um, uh, uh, Safety Review is run by a Republican, and if Jeb Bush were to kill his mother, you would never read it linked off of that aggregator. But there is one run by Progress Florida, which is a Democratic organization that does a better job of picking up a broader spectrum of news. Uh, but there are ways to go online and find other, uh, find find stories that are not behind a paywall, uh, but uh, and and get news. I'd watch a good television newscast. You can't always find one. Um, I would eliminate Fox and MSNBC from that list uh, because I think they are both tilted in the opposite direction so far that what you get is not going to be just a general newscast. Um, at home, I generally watch the CBS News at night. I think it gives a better report than most of the others. Uh, but I would, you know, some nights, I, it, depending on if the football game is running late, you can't find CBS some nights, and so you have to go it. But I try to always watch somebody's newscast, if for no other reason to see how many stories they've stolen out of that day's New York Times. Uh, but uh, uh, it, um, uh, the New York Times, I think, continues to be the gold standard of papers. Uh, and, uh, and it's amazing to me how many days that Every news organization in the country is picking up their stuff and running it. That's uh, been my experience. Uh, a more personal thing, uh, when you uh, retired, uh, I don't know which time, uh, your staff uh, in the Tallahassee Bureau gave you a quilt that, that, uh, that uh, looks kind of like a newspaper, but they put various, they highlighted various words on there about you. What were some of those words? Oh, well, they were descriptions they got from various people about me. Uh, bitch, red wine please, um, a force of nature. Uh, all, some of them were nice and some of them were not very nice. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a great quilt and it has Lucy written in the middle of it. Uh, Joni James, who was one of our editorial writers, made the quilt. So some of us who write do have some other talent. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good to know. Uh, do you have a favorite story that you've written over the years? I know you used to say the, the next one. It usually is the next one, but I don't know what the next one is right now. Um, I may—I don't know that I've quit completely. I may. Uh, Impossible. Impossible. I, 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 well, my next one is one of my mobsters is getting sentenced. Um, I um, when we we spend half the year in the Western North Carolina, and uh, the, I have found that day in and day out, one of the best sources for news is anybody's beauty shop. Uh, and so I uh, walked into the beauty shop a few years ago up there to get my hair cut, and I, there had been rumors that somebody was building a Ritz-Carlton in the middle of nowhere near where we are in, in North Carolina. It, it is this guy's mistake that he did this there, I think. Uh, he knows that now. But um, they, um, uh, so I asked the beautician, 
uh, how, uh, for some details. She says, well, he's a mobster. I said, well, how do you know he's a mobster? She said, well, he's from New York and he wears gold chains all the time. I said, you know, I need a little more than that. Uh, and she, I said, what's his name? And she said, well, I don't know, but it sounds like Buffalo. So a day or two later, I happened to be looking into some records. I do the research for our little community up there on who's buying and selling property in the area. And I was online looking at deeds, and I decided to look and see who was buying around further out from where we are. And there was a whole bunch of property being deeded to some woman named May Rebuffo. And I figured out from looking at one of her mortgages that her husband was Dominic Rebuffo. And when I ran his name into Google, his part business partner in New York had been wiped out in a mob hit in, in a restaurant in Manhattan. <laughs> and he had been sent to jail in a mortgage fraud in Manhattan. Well, alas, uh, he ran out of luck. He um, he and his friends uh, were doing another mortgage fraud scam in North Carolina off of banks in Florida, uh, which gave me the hook to do a story on it. Uh, they had a, they were convicted in a fifty million dollar bank fraud, and he has just been he's seventy eight, and he's just been sentenced to twenty seven years in federal prison, um, and the rest of the people are being sentenced in another week or so. So I got to do that one now. That was after your first retirement. That was uh, yeah, uh, yeah, oh yes. She'll never retire, folks. It was just one, and I don't want her to either. And I don't think you do either. Okay, now I, I'm I'm done. I would like to ha know what's on your mind. Questions? There's a step up to the microphone. No speeches. No dancing. No poetry. Can they dance? I don't know, but I just don't want to see. <laughs> Lucy, when are you going to run for office? Uh, never. <laughs> I'm not going to ever give chance of p people a chance to vote against me. <laughs> Is there anybody good running for office? Yeah, they're from time to time. Uh, unfortunately, most most people who run, who, most of the good people who run, don't want to raise the the kind of money that you have to run raise to run. I truly think that until we get the amount of money we've got. It's circulating in the political system uh, under control. We can't fix what's wrong. Uh, that um, it's the system is broken. The Supreme Court's rulings that allow anonymous, essentially anonymous money to pour into campaigns uh, is is just a horrible precedent to set uh, for electing people in th in this state. And uh, I think the only way we can cure it is with a constitutional amendment, and that's going to be hard to do. Askew was looking at that. You know, uh, yes. Hi, from one cat lady to another. When you got started in journalism out of nowhere, why did you stay? There are lots of ways to make money, a lot easier ways to make lots more money. Nothing is more fun than aggravating some of these bad sheriffs and public <laughs> officials. I mean, it really, it's fun. Um, I was always entertained. The Times was a great place to work because they sent me to places like Leon. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, it, the Times has always been willing to allow me to pursue a really good story, uh, and some of it was Foley's fart, fault. He, uh, when we went to the lottery in the '80s, he calls me and said, "You know, I'd kind of like you to go look at where they print the lottery tickets and do a feature on that." And I said, "Oh, okay." And a few minutes later, he said, by the way, where do they print the lottery tickets? And I said, right outside San Francisco. I'm on my way. <laughs> but the, but the, it, I mean, what could be more fun? Hi, my name's Elaine Rosa. Thank you for talking with us. Um, I was just wondering how your methods of research and reporting have changed as technology has changed. Uh, well, the technology's changed dramatically. When I came into this business, we uh, the ch we transmitted stories uh, uh, by dictating them on the phone. Uh, I years ago I was in Cedar Key for a hurricane, uh, and the road washed out, so we were stranded there. And there was with me with several other reporters, and I got on the phone to dictate a story. Normally, we had somebody that was very fast, but on that day, I said, "Give it a Cedar Key Dateline." And the voice says, how do you spell cedar? 
I thought it's going to be a long night here. <laughs> uh, but by the time I finished that story, the other reporters had dismantled the phone booth and brought me two Bloody Marys. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but no, so we, we, it was very uh, non-technical back then. Then uh, we got computers that were so heavy you could barely lift them that we carried around and did it. Now, you know, we do it. Uh, we can file off an iPad or an iPhone. We discovered during Hurricane Katrina that... Uh, we couldn't find any wireless systems or any phone systems that worked, but we could text for some reason. So a lot of stories got filed by text message that way. And um, so that, that all of the technology is different. Back when we took pictures when I entered this business, we had to put a roll of film on the bus to St. Pete. Some of that film is traveling yet in the Greyhound system. Never got there. <laughs> but um, so the, the technology is probably the single biggest change. Uh, when I was working on the Scientology deaths, I was looking at court cases in Australia, all over Europe, all over the United States. Uh, and I could find a huge amount of what I needed online or find somebody that would email them to me um, from, you know, some lawyer or, or court that would email the stuff to me. Uh, and I, if I had tried to do that story 10 years earlier, I'd have, the travel budget would have been enormous. So um, the, the Internet has helped a lot. I mean, it's, it's fragmented the industry a great deal at the moment, but... Uh, it, uh, it is helpful in, in trying to gather stories. The, the, almost every courthouse anywhere has, for instance, land records on rec on, online, uh, which are really easy to access. And, and most people have at least some of their court records online. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I grew up in St. Petersburg, and I've been reading you for years and years. Hundred years. I probably. thank you for that. <laughs> uh, my question is that Gwen Graham ran a campaign, really emphasizing being nonpartisan and pledging herself to work across the aisle. Uh, you know, I try really hard these days. I'm not by nature a cynic, and it's hard to me remain uncynical. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, about about certainly the Congress, but are th what number of other people would you say there are in Congress like Gwen, and what chance do they have to even make any kind of a dent? From what I see uh, and read, not, not much of a chance. I, c I don't know the other members of Congress that are not in the headlines a lot as well as I know Gwen Graham. Uh, so it's hard for me to say how many like her there are. I'm sure there are some. Not many of them are from Florida because I know all of these guys, most of them used to be in the legislature. Uh, or they've suddenly appeared on the street here, like Mr. Yoho. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, the, um, uh, I mean, oddly enough, some of the people that we've elected from Florida were not good legislators when they were in the legislature, and all of a sudden they're now members of Congress. Uh, so I think they're probably very few. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, I think, is the money that's involved. These people have to raise such an incredible amount of money uh, to get themselves elected that they have committed themselves to a philosophy, uh, to certain industries. Uh, they, they owe a lot of people by the time they get elected. Gwen was fortunate in that she had her father with her to help her a lot of the way in this. And uh, Graham had a, uh, uh, although he hadn't been on a ballot in a lot of years, uh, he, he has a good reputation in Florida. Uh, and I think that helped her enormously. I don't think that he had a polarizing reputation. When he was governor, uh, the Republicans that were in the legislature were much more moderate than the Republicans that are here today. Uh, we had lunch with Graham in uh, North Carolina this summer. We happened to all be up there at the same time, and uh, I, I said to him that I used to think it didn't, what party you were in didn't matter much, that it, because I always voted for the person and not the party. And he said, we know, he said that, well, back then you would have been right because a lot, all the Republicans that we had in office were moderate Republicans who weren't that polarizing uh, in the in at the time. Uh, now I don't think a moderate Republican can get elected in most Florida districts.
Thank you for coming. I'm, um, I'm a professor here at the University of Florida, and I have a question. Um, I was actually encouraged to come hear your talk, and I actually read one of your books, the one that, uh, where you reported on uh, corruption in sheriff's office. Uh -huh. Right. And so my question is, um, in a university setting, are you concerned that there's a growing corruption in our university, in not this one, but in general? And what advice would you give to somebody who is concerned? I'm concerned about some, uh, some of the things, particularly things like uh, the Institute in Tallahassee that is getting a lot of its money from the Koch brothers and giving them the right to s help select professors at the university. Um, the, the, it's, I don't know how widespread that kind of an agreement is, uh, but the business school at Florida State accepted a good bit of money from the Kochs uh, for an for some sort of endowed chair and gave them the right to regularly ch review what they're teaching and who's teaching it. Uh, and uh, if that's happening in any widespread form, yeah, I'm very concerned. I do think all of the universities are a bit more politicized than they used to be. Uh, you have selected a new president that, that appears not to be a part of that scene. I. I don't know that that will last. Depends on uh, I, I, the legislature has gotten such to be such a place where you've got to go um, satisfy a lot of egos uh, that uh, even a stranger who comes to town learns that pretty quickly uh, and and begins to uh, comply with what they want. So yeah, I'm I'm worried. Um, I, do you have any chairs that you know of like that where? The person who donated the money has been given a, a say in what you teach or who teaches it? I would go so far as to say some of the some of the officials who have been selected specifically for either a political agenda or to drive a an economic agenda which may not be in line. We have a constitution here. And when you look at our constitution, and, you, and I think very few people have taken a look at our bylaws. Mm -hmm. When you look at these and you see really what's going on, you know, I've been here for 15 years. You say, what is this all about, you know? And I've been at several, I've been at a few other universities. Um, and I wouldn't say it's just local. And so my question is, and to me, it, it summarizes in, in one word. It, it looks like corruption to me. And so there's strong motives to behave in this fashion. And, but I think people are, people don't, faculty or even staff, they really don't know what to do. A lot of our, our, you know, our regulations in some way serve only a certain class. And that class, very similar to what I read in your book, are possibly motivated by, you know, by, by money, by greed, by power. But what one sees in this, you know, in this environment is perhaps a degradation of our of our values, and I think students I also teach they're also asking me these questions. I don't have answers, so my question to you is: People have asked me, how do you go about bringing you know the the pendulum Thank back you. exactly? Because this really is one of the last bastions of truth. Well, it's I, I think the university system is probably in the same boat that a lot of others in Florida. And until you can change the officials who are governing it, uh, you are you're in danger. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I, in, in past elections, I would have said, you got what the voters wanted. But in this case, two thirds of the voters didn't vote. Uh, and uh, so, I, until we can cure that problem uh, and fix the money problem, I don't think you can fix the university problems as easily as you would might like to. What is the uh size of the newsroom today compared to when you and Mike were there at the Tampa Bay Times and uh, what are the implications of that? You know I don't know the answer to that. Do you know the numbers? I do know that when I was there and when I, when I was executive editor I had 428 people working for me and a budget an annual budget of 24 million dollars that was 20 years ago. So and I, I would guess that this is nowhere near that. I would guess that it's half that maybe. At most. Um, it, um, but uh, and that 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 may be true at all newspapers in Florida certainly, um, and in some places it's worse than that. Um, and the implications of that are obvious. There are things that are not being covered that once were, um, and.
and um, and Florida is poorer for it. But um, I hope we are in a period of time of re sort of rearranging the deck chairs. Hopefully not on the Titanic, uh, and uh, to and that there will be something at the other end of this that will be better for all papers. It, it's interesting to me that in some places, uh, people like Warren Buffett are buying papers. Bezos has bought the Post and is putting money into it. The Post has hired 100 new reporters. And it may be that we go back, sort of back to the future in this, where we're using very wealthy people who own papers. Uh, that may change what journalism is uh, and who, who it afflicts at times, but it might be better than some of some of what we're seeing now, where I think chain journalism has been very bad for the for the st nation as a whole, and what we're seeing happen with Gannett and some of these others uh, is the result of that, where people are just giving the a bottom line somewhere and saying, okay, you got to get rid of 30 staffers or something, and we, you got to save all that money, uh, and they don't care particularly the the people calling those shots don't care or know what they're doing to the paper when they do that. But it, it, it is a serious time uh, that I hope is going to get better, certainly for the Tampa Bay Times in the near future. I'm curious as to how you picked the topics that you wanted to work on and did you have to vet them by Mike or did you, did you have enough independence at a point in time where you just went and did it? I had a good bit of independence. I also learned that if I heard about a story, uh, rather than immediately picking up the phone and calling an editor, I would do a little spade work to see if the story was really there, what was there. And uh, once I had a f good idea myself of what the story was, I would then tell an editor, here's what I got I'm, I'm working on. Sometimes I would give them a list of maybe eight or ten things that I knew might be developable as stories. and. Um, I was usually working with an editor who was good enough to let me go do what I thought was the best thing to do. Uh, one of the great joys of working for the Times was that was the freedom they gave me to develop things. And sort of one story leads to another when you're doing it that way. You talked of your cat. Are journalists ever in, um, feel like somebody's intimidating them or, or, or they, that they are at risk of their life? Oh, I'm sure they do. People try to intimidate us all the time. Intimidation comes in many forms. My mountain mobster, when I finished interviewed him, said, remember, Lucy, I know where you live. I have very simple and nice, uh, but uh, I mean, I had a lot of threats when I was working uh, more on the cop stories than on drug smuggling stories, but um, it, uh, I think you just have to, it, when you get in this business and you take up serious news, you have to expect that you're going to write things people won't like. And you need you have to develop a fairly tough skin to do it. Uh, and I was just I just tried to act prudently. I had guys call me up and want me to meet them on the Steenachie River Bridge at midnight. Well, I do have a brain. I said, how about I would say, how about the courthouse steps at noon? And so you know, I tried not to get myself in a position where I was I could be uh, somebody could physically harm me. Uh, and um, I uh, the the Florida Department of Law Enforcement urged me never to spend a night in Dixie and Taylor County while I was working on those stories. So I didn't, I drove either to Gainesville, Tallahassee, or back home in the Tampa Bay area. Every single day I worked on stories there. Um, just because it, it, I've got half the cops in the state telling me it's not intelligent for you to stay in that county. I had to, I had to, I, and they would be the ones that would have to bail me out if I got in trouble. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, I, I think anybody who works on serious news is, may get threatened from time to time. But fortunately, a lot of us uh, I don't believe it's really going to happen to us. I think I'm more likely to get it on US 19 or someplace than I am from somebody that... that uh, in fact, uh, Jerry Blair, the state attorney in Live Oak, once said that he hoped I didn't get shot in his circuit because it would take too long to question the suspects. <laughs> and, uh, uh, to what extent did the uh, Klan infiltrate the sheriff's departments in Florida, and to what extent did the FBI turn a blind eye to it? I think to a huge extent, if you read Devil in the Grove, uh, the the book about uh, Lake County and uh, Willis McCall, uh, 
I, I knew uh, deputies who, who told me they were Klan members. I knew some deputies in neighboring Levy County and, the, and a bail bondsman over there who carried KKK cards in their wallets. Um, and uh, uh, some of them would pretend it was a joke if you got serious about it. Uh, but um, I don't, there's not any question in my mind that a lot of deputies, particularly in rural counties, uh, and probably a lot of other public officials, were, were Klan members. Uh, oh, prior to say about 1980, um, we had some really serious uh, race, racial problems in Central Florida that hung over into the early 70s. Uh, as some some schools were not, uh, although the the Supreme Court decision came in 1956, there were a lot of schools that were still not integrated in the 70s in Florida. Uh oh, so, so I'm I'm a stranger here, uh, living in my seventh state, and I'm having a hard time figuring out how the legislature works. <laughs> it seems to me, from what I can read, that at times it's the Speaker of the House who is the center of power, and then I read how J. D. Alexander got a brand new university in his own hometown without the legislature even voting on it. So well, help me understand how things really. Actually, work. they did vote on it. They put it in the budget. But, uh, but only only one of the two chambers voted on it. The other no, they both voted they on it. Passed it by consent, right? They didn't vote well, on it. Well, they 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 voted. They could have somebody could have killed it, but they didn't. He was the appropriations chairman in the Senate. The power rests with the two appropriations chairman and the speaker and the Senate president, and to some extent the governor. But a lot of that depends on who the governor is and how he how much he's learned about using that power. Uh, but in the case of that 12th university, J.D. got it put in the budget and it went through both houses in the finished budget uh, and the governor accepted it. But um, it, um, I mean, it, 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 it never should have been there. I don't know whether it will fail or succeed, but we didn't need a 12th university, most of you would say, I think, uh, and now we have it. Uh, but. Um, a lot of what happens in the legislature gets done because a particular lobbyist wants it done or not done. Um, the lobbying corps in Tallahassee has the real power. You, the elected officials have to vote it, but they are paying the, the lobbyists are paying for virtually everything that's done one way or another. Uh, it's it's sort of like the King Ranch thing if you read any of those stories. Uh, the lobbyists donate the money to the Republican Party. The party pays the tab. Technically, it's illegal for the lobbyists to donate to give it to pay for something for a legislator. Uh, but when they donate the money to the party, then the party does it, and often that's by prior arrangement, so that it's just a simple little money laundering operation that they're running, uh, where they get them to pay for it. But uh, it, although, I mean, we wrote stories about all the illegal gifts in the. 80s and early 90s, which caused them to change the law. They're very good about changing the law when you when you point out a little mistake. When I first went up there, I wrote a story about all the illegal trips and gifts that the legislators were taking. Uh, at the time, it was a crime to accept a misdemeanor to accept any gift value at more than $25, and I caught a bunch of them accepting a whole lot of stuff. They came back the next year, and man, did they ever fix that law. They erased the criminal penalty. It is, was no longer a crime. Uh, but, so, uh, you can, but, but it is real, the, the power is in the lobbying, and particularly in the big lobbying firms. There are about, oh, three or four firms. Uh, they have to report their income, but they do it in ranges, so it's hard to tell exactly how much is going into it. Uh, but uh, there are a number of lobbyists that take in uh, well over a couple of million a year. Uh, Ronnie Book even admits to taking in about four million a year, I think. And uh, the figures are similar to a, for a lot of others. Uh, and a lot of that money is being paid by governmental agencies who are trying to get something out of them. But uh, it, uh, U.S. Sugar, Blue Cross, um, the, um, some of the insurance companies, Florida Power and Light, Duke Energy, uh, those are the big players on the money field, and you will almost never see them pass anything that hurts any of those people. Just come watch sometime. Well, I don't know about you, but I could sit here all evening and just listen to them 
especially these two talk about uh, Florida, Florida politics, uh, the newspaper industry, and uh, the Sunshine Law and where we're headed as a state. Uh, thank you, Lucy Morgan. Thank you, Mike Foley, for making such, this such a delightful evening. Thank you all for taking the time to join us. Thanks, David.